Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge 16, brought to you by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to Knowledge 16, everybody. This is theCUBE. theCUBE is SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and we extract the signal from the noise. We're here, uh, this is day two for us. We'll be going wall to wall for three days at Knowledge uh, 16. Hashtag no 16. Chris Beatty is here, he's a CIO, relatively new CIO at ServiceNow. Chris, thanks for coming on theCUBE and spending sure, some time with us. Sure, happy to be here. So Good you were hosting the CIO Decisions event yesterday. I was, uh, great event. We had a lot of CIOs, mm -hmm. a lot of energy in the room. You know, one of the main, main themes was, you know, technology change happens all the time, but really, what are the leadership challenges, right? And, and what courage is required of leaders to really break through the status quo and get to that next level? You know, we talked a lot about the importance of getting the right culture, right, within IT, and that's a, and, and what it really means to have a service mindset, right, throughout the enterprise. And as our vocabulary becomes the same inside IT and across all the departments, right, as a leader, how do you enact that change? So really a lot about the human element as opposed to, you know, the technology part of it. Yeah, so a um, lot of discussions over the past several ServiceNow Knowledge Conference, of one year Frank said, he sort of threw down the gauntlet and said, CIOs, they have to be business leaders. You know, no longer is it just a, a technology role. Um, others have come on the cube and said, well, you know, CIO's role, they got to choose. They got to choose a technical path or a, or a business path, or, or a data path even, <coughs> chief data officer. What are your yeah. thoughts on the future Yeah, I mean, the there's CIO? a lot of press about the role of the CIO, right? And if you go back years, it's anything from CIO's dead, IT's irrelevant, right? It's going the way of the dodo bird to CIO's more strategic than ever, disrupting and creating new business models. I think the answer is somewhere in between. And it's probably changes, you know, depending on the day of the week, right? So CIOs have a base job, which is running, you know, the technology infrastructure of any company, running the applications. But I do agree with Frank in terms of CIOs up-leveling their responsibilities and taking on the responsibility for more. I can tell you what I take responsibility for, right? And yes, it's IT, but the overall velocity of our business. How fast can we run with everything? Hiring employees, closing our books, every single process in the company is powered by an IT platform, right? And so IT is really in a unique position and it has a bird's eye view of the organization to really help drive velocity. And velocity is everything. How can you out outflank your competition? The other thing I see, think uh, CIOs need to take responsibility for is maximizing the productivity of every single employee in the company, right? And if you take that on, you start to look at things a little bit differently. It's not about IT projects. It's really about outcomes and, and you know, what measurable things are we delivering? And last and certainly not least, I think the responsibility for customer experiences, again, Customer experiences are powered by IT platforms. CIOs have the ability to influence every single one of those experiences and make it great. And more and more, as we look towards the future with things like automated bots and augmented reality, customer interactions are going to become human to platform. And that's going to increase IT's relevance in that. So in thinking about CIO imperatives, uh, the, you know, the, the, the bromide of 80% of the dollars we spend is on keeping the lights on and and 20% on innovation. I don't know if that's a real number, you know, but nobody seems to argue with it. Yeah, um, you hear that number a lot, but I think the good organizations actually do measure that number. So they, actually, they will know what their number is. And at ServiceNow, we've done a lot of work. So our ratio is actually 60% run the business, 40% on innovation, and we're driving that down so it's an even 50-50 split. I think that where you don't want to go is, is spending too little time on what I call the utility computing, because that's the fabric that gets work done, right? It's everything from networking and email and all those basic services you still need to have. Those aren't going anywhere, collaboration services. I'd like to split it up into a little finer grain. I wonder if you could comment. Run the business, grow the business, transform the business. Now maybe you're, maybe you're always transforming your business, I don't know, but in I terms think you of- have to be. In terms of spe specific spending on initiatives to transform the business, is that a reasonable, reasonable way to look at your portfolio as a CIO? Absolutely, right? And I think if you're not doing things to transform your business, you're, you're not acting with enough urgency. So my view on it is, identify the big rocks, right, that we need to knock down. Make sure we make room for those. 
even if it's at the cost of the grow or run part of the budget. Because if you're not getting those things done, again, back to that getting left behind, things are moving too quick. You gotta keep pace. So make room for the transformation somehow. And that means squeezing every bit of automation that you can out of the run part of the business, which is something I've used ServiceNow for in my past. I used to be a customer. I bought the platform twice over before I joined the company. And we, I did it a lot, and I'm doing it now, now that I'm at ServiceNow. That's one of Frank's requirements to become a CIO, I think. Is, yeah. <laughs> but, um, how do you measure that, that split? You said you're at 60 today, you'd like to be at 50. A lot of CIOs go, I have no idea how to measure that. I look at my projects, or, but I guess. How yeah. do you do it? And, and it's tough. We actually use, not surprisingly, our own IT financial management module to do that. And so uh, technology is technology, but we take all of our GL data, and, and we map it to a taxonomy of business services. And certain business services we know are not transformative, but they're a run part of the business. And we do that mapping once, and then every month we can look at actuals against it. We can look at our unit costs. But the other big input is projects, right? Which is, again, also in our platform. So we're able to look at those two things together and a data-driven segmentation of our spend. Too many times I've seen IT organizations, they do it as one-time exercise, as part of annual planning, then they don't look at it again until the next year annual planning. But there's a lot of runway in between and decisions you're making every day, which you should be making based upon data, but instead you're doing it on perhaps nine months ago information. So you essentially categorize the, the business process, the business services, as run or... Grow or transform grow. And, 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 and for on us, an ongoing basis. Absolutely, and you do the map, and, and the most dynamic part of it is projects. So every one of sure. our projects, when we look at our portfolio, we look at our project portfolio by business area, so sales, marketing, HR, finance, so on. But then we also do categorize our portfolio by, is this just sort of keep the lights on activity? But it's a project we still need to do. Or is it growing the business in some way, or is it truly helping us transform the way we operate? Yeah, and reasonable people can sit down and agree on sort of what those look like and, sure. and, and, we it, also, and adjust accordingly. We also do a top-down allocation of how, what percentage do we want to go into each bucket. And that's not the same for each area because different parts of our business are at different maturity curves, different pressures on them. Um, I, I wouldn't want to be very transformative with our GL, right? That's not an area I want to innovate on. But with our sales and marketing organization, absolutely, we want to be in high innovation, high experimentation, whatever we can do to help drive So growth. that's a top-down, bottom-up exercise where the executive team says, okay, Top, this is kind of... Top, bottom, sideways, inputs from everywhere. It, you know, one of the things I think CIOs, um, is in, it is incumbent upon CIOs to do is, is manage um, spend, but more importantly, where are people spending their time, right? That's an arguably a fixed cost. You have a set of people, where are they spending their time and are they spending their time on the right things? And uh, if you get that right, the rest can get a lot easier. So Secretary Gates last night speaking to, you know, maybe about roughly 100 CIOs in your, in your CIO decisions conference, gave the thumbs down on consensus management. And I sensed just a little bit of discomfort in the room because CIOs is a hard job, right? You serve a lot of different masters, if you will. Mm -hmm. And as well, you've got heads of application development, you got you know, architects, you got the business to serve, and so there's a lot of consensus building. And so he got questions on how do you do that. What was your reaction to that? I mean, your colleagues, you know, what, what was your sense of that? I actually asked him a, a question, and because he said consensus building doesn't work, and to an outside person looking in, uh, it would seem like by nature everything in the government is consensus oriented. <laughs> he, he, he had a lot of examples actually where he did things against his own team's conviction, but he felt like that change was necessary. So, so two things, I think Dr. Gates has dealt with monumental organizations, right? Uh, Texas A&M is the smallest organization of those, the CIA and the DOD. The Department of Defense has three million people. So the scale is unlike what most enterprise CIOs or leaders have seen. So when, when he talked about not being consensus oriented, he viewed it as a requirement, and I actually agree with him. If you're trying to disrupt the status quo, you can't be consensus oriented. I don't think you'll move fast enough, and, and most of the time you won't get very far. So I think it's incumbent upon leaders to be the ones that break the status quo and say, we got to change. And, but what, what Dr. Gates did describe is that if people are informed about the why from their leader enough, even if they disagree, they can get on board. And he brought up numerous examples of where 
he had conversations with Congress and people within the DOD about change he wanted to drive. And even though they were very opposed to it, they got on board because they intellectually could understand why. And over time, he won over hearts and minds. How about your priorities? So you come in relatively new to, to service now. So first of all, first impressions, um, any, any surprises, pleasant or unpleasant? And what are your priorities? So uh, coming in, uh, no surprises. I had, I had a lot of admiration for the company as a, as a customer. And, and now that I'm here, I love the culture. The culture is very execution oriented, get stuff done, very customer focused. You know, when we, when we talk about our go to market, we really talk a lot about what's going to be most important for our customers. What pressures are our customers under? What problems can we solve for them? It's really not a discussion around squeezing you know, the max amount of margin out of each customer, which I think is fantastic. Um, it, we, we drive pretty hard, but, but we're also very team oriented culture. So that's been great. My priorities at ServiceNow, when I think about my six strategic themes that I'm focused on, growth uh, is hugely important at ServiceNow right now. So a lot of time I spend sales and marketing effectiveness and innovation and what can we do to drive, uh, help drive growth uh, from an IT perspective. Uh, working with our partner organization, helping our partners uh, do business with us easier, things like partner portals and things like that. Uh, velocity I mentioned earlier, driving velocity through every department at the enterprise, at ServiceNow, and really maniacally going after business process automation. And the great thing is we have a platform that makes it easy, right? And I have ac full access to that platform. So self-service catalogs and knowledge base, but really going department by department saying how do we do that analytics, Obviously, we want to continue to measure and improve our business, but we're starting to do a lot more with predictive analytics, right? And, and how can we use data to really predict next best actions in a variety of arenas? Uh, security is the uh, gift that keeps on giving for every CIO, uh, never ending. Uh, and uh, it's just one of those things that'll be a constant. Interesting angle. <laughs> um, you got you to you accept it. And then uh, really focus on team. Right? I think talent and team and culture are hugely important. You could have the best plans you know, on paper, but if you don't have the right talent and culture within your team to get it done, I don't think you're getting very far. Operational rigor is a big one for me and a metrics-based approach to managing our business and driving outcomes. So when I look at projects that I execute for the organization, on time and on budget, that's fine, that's table stakes. Really what I'm after is on benefit. Right? Are we delivering the benefits that we said we were going to get? Um, and last but certainly not least, a part of my job is now on now. And what, what we mean by now on now is me being our best and first customer. And that's at a very strategic level, working with product management to help them you know, with roadmap features and things like that, that I think all of our CEOs would need. Um, also upgrading early, so hopefully we can iron out the bugs before all of our customers, and then consuming our own pr newer products and implementing it internally, learning the lessons within our four walls so that we can inform our fields, so they can help our customers. How about on benefit? Uh, what percent of your projects are on benefit? That's another one of these things. 70% of the projects fail. It was a number, I don't know, yeah, one of the market but, research. And, for, and even, for, that, for, even that's a problem, yeah. because fail is identified as not being on time or on budget. Right, right. right, and I view that as interesting but not compelling. Are you delivering the outcome? And so, we're early. I've only been at service now six months, but I know in the past, through rigor and even making it a metric that's important, I've gotten to an 85% hit rate on benefit. Um, certainly you could do better. But some of the benefits we have realized with our platform, um, an 83% increase in IT productivity leveraging our, 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 our application. But examples outside of IT where we've eliminated 4,500 hours of work from our financial close by putting email and manual checklists onto our platform. 85% uh, reduction in time that we spent, hours spent on onboarding new employees. I mean, the list goes on and on, but um, it, it's a requirement in my organization, when you're doing a project, you got to have an outcome and set an aspirational outcome. Because if you talk about a 10% improvement in anything, that's sort of easy to get. But if you tell yourself, I need to get a 70% improvement, it forces you to really rethink things. And, and think differently. And I think that's our job as leaders, to set, those, set the bar really high and ensure our teams have the resources to go after it. So even if you're late and over budget, if you get that outcome. I didn't say that. 
You're not allowed to be later over budget. I was going to ask you though. So, no. so that's got to be all three. So that's a, that's a prerequisite. Budget. You got to be on time and on budget. Yeah, and we're not perfect, yeah. but uh, our our target is to be 95% on time, 95% on budget, knowing you're going to have 5%, you know, wiggle room, and 95% on benefit. What is on? So when you talk to the board, the switch topics about security. What should be on a CIO's checklist for communicating to the board about security? So, so I think it's really about risk, right? And what risks do we think we have? What's the likelihood of those risks? And what's the plan to mitigate those risks? I don't think security should be talked about in a, this is done or that's done, because you're never really done, right? It's risk management. And the bad guys continue to innovate faster than the good guys. So what's your current security posture? What's the state of your risks? And how are you mitigating them? And in what time frame? Um, you know, the stuff about, you know, we have DLP, we have IDS, we have IPS. I mean, the list of acronyms um, is, is interesting at a more tactical level. But at a board level, I think it's really risk management. So I have a premise I want to put forth. So you say, talk about mitigating risk. But is there a, a place for a narrative that says, you can only mitigate so much. You're going to get penetrated. It's how you respond. Absolutely. That is critical. And I Absolutely. can, I as the CIO can lead that response or whomever is the appropriate yeah. person. I, I think you, you have to do everything you possibly can to secure your perimeter. But it's known that you are going to get breached. It's just a fact. So then it be, really becomes how quickly can you identify the fact that you have anomalous activity happening on your network or data? How quickly can you mitigate it? And um, in the past, when I was at VeriSign JDSU, um, a lot of that was manual, right? You, have, you know you have a piece of bad malware in the enterprise. You may even know what assets um, it's on, or you think you know. Usually you <laughs> think you know, and then you really find out later where, where it's gone. But tying those assets to risk, meaning what business service is it? Is it my CFO's laptop, or is it you know, the, 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 you know, the person in AP? So you treat it a little bit differently. And is it the infrastructure that supports our badge reader? Or is it our ERP system? Right, so that's the missing piece. And I do thank our security organization and our, and our business unit, Sean, because they've actually built a solution to help solve that, where you can go from security incident, piece of malware, to asset, to business service, to employee, within minutes, which that used to be half a day at least. And half a day is a long time in a security incident. Yeah, so there's that magic number of whatever it is, 205 days uh, to detect a penetration. Yes, yeah, scary. Right? Do you feel like your organization can compress that? Is that a viable metric to be focused on? It, it, it's certainly a viable metric to focus on in terms of um, knowledge of, of, again, anomalous activity. I don't think we're near 205 days, but uh, absolutely we are focused on it. I mean, because we need to secure not only our data, but the data that our customers entrust, with us, entrust us with. Meaning you, you feel as though you can detect much in a much shorter time frame. I mean, that was some industry De average depending number. On, depending stuff. on the risk, right, yeah. without getting into a lot of the details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, so you, but implicit in that is that you have a sense of the value of your data, your assets, your IP, which you're saying you've got pretty good visibility on. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, we do. We, we spend a lot of time making sure our security posture is solid, again, Customers entrust us with their data. We take that responsibility very seriously. Not speaking for service now, but just general knowledge sure. of your colleagues. Do you feel as though the lack of ability to value data, assets, IP, um, negatively affects people's ability to, to appropriately spend it's, yeah, resources it, on it, security? It, it's tough, because one of the, the first things you need to do in security is say, what do I need to secure first? And then you say, okay, well, that's my core IP. Well, where is my core IP stored? I would argue that a lot of companies don't even know because it's scattered on different file shares and different servers, and then you don't know whether people are putting it on Box or Dropbox or one of the many storage sites out there. So a key, key first step, I think, for a lot of organizations is really just getting a handle on where their IP is. Right. All right. Big challenge. Chris, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming on. Last, give you the last word. Uh, knowledge. 16 for you, what's the what's kind of bumper sticker as the trucks are pulling away from yeah, it's the It's been Mandalay awesome, base. I mean, just talking with uh, customers and fellow CIOs, you know, we're all in this journey together towards this service-enabled enterprise, um, but it is a, about leadership and just courage to bust through this current status quo that we're in within the enterprise to get to that next level of efficiency. 
Excellent. It's a lot work. of fun. Well, congratulations on the new role and, uh, and hosting that awesome conference. I just caught the tail end of it, but it looked like great energy. It was a lot of fun. I've had some really good discussions with some of your colleagues, so really appreciate great. you coming on. Thank you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. This is theCUBE. We'll be back from Knowledge 16 in Las Vegas right after this. Every once in a while, a true